Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for Floss. Thank you for the message that you've given to her this morning. And thank you for your desire to have this deep personal relationship with each one of us and to be close to us throughout the day. Lord, please help Floss as she preaches and, and us to listen and to hear not just human words, Lord, but your word spoken into our hearts. For we pray. Good morning, everybody. How am I for sound? Sound all right? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Um, you can always tell when I'm preaching because I wear a skirt, but um, that's because I, <laughs> I've been to the 8.30. So. so we're continuing. In fact, I think this is the last of our series in, in prayer this morning, and the focus is on prayer in a busy life. And I think Moray must have given me this topic because he's heard me moaning about how busy I am so much. So it's been a challenge for me to dig into this subject and I'm going to share some of, some of my thoughts and some of the things that I've been learning um, along the way. So who, fe- who here feels really busy, run off their feet, overstretched, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when Moray said recently, recently challenged us to um, spend an hour every day in prayer with God, um, who have you thought, who's he kidding, honestly? <laughs> his wife just put his hand up. <laughs> so I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but nothing I'm going to say this morning is going to undermine that central challenge to us to spend an hour every day in prayer with God. It's absolutely vital for us to spend those long periods of time in quietness and stillness with God every day, worshipping, adoring, uh, contemplating and listening to him. And if we're finding ourselves, <coughs> excuse me, if we're finding ourselves too busy to do that, then perhaps we need to take a long, hard look at what we are doing that's stopping us from doing that, uh, and whether we need to reassess our priorities. But realistically, there are going to be times when it's not possible to spend that um, hour um, every day um, with God. If we leave the house at 6:30 and get home at 8:30 at night, too exhausted to speak. Uh, If you have young children who are keeping you on the run at every hour of the day and night, if you have uh, caring responsibilities or other significant demands on your time, it's sometimes going to be impossible to keep that one-hour appointment with God every day. Uh, Now, Jesus was unquestionably a busy man. Um, One day, uh, at the beginning of of Mark's Gospel, we hear uh, he starts off teaching in the synagogue. He drives out an evil spirit there. He goes uh, back to Simon's house for a bit of a rest, but his mother and Simon's mother-in-law is sick, so he has to heal her. Uh, And then after sunset, the people from the surrounding area brought all their sick to him um, and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered, and Jesus healed them. And that's all in one day. What a busy man, how many demands there were on his time. And yet the next day, we read, uh, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This is one of many references to Jesus taking himself off to a solitary place to pray. But look what happens next. Have we got our... Sorry, we're, that, that's, that's a quick picture of my household. <laughs> Even the dog and the cat are busy. Um, next one. Um, so this is, yeah, this is where we are. Um, What what happens next is Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they explained, everyone is looking for you. So even Jesus found it hard to protect his time alone with God the Father. (coughs) But that didn't mean that his relationship with the Father suffered. Jesus didn't have to make an appointment with the Father in order to spend time with him, and nor do we. Prayer, listening and speaking to God was so much a part of Jesus' life that you could hardly see the join. I want to look briefly at two examples of this before seeing how we can follow Jesus' pattern in our own lives. The first is in Luke 9, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is surrounded by a huge crowd of hungry and tired people, and the disciples are telling him to send them all home. Jesus tells the 12 to make the people sit down. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Hold that phrase in your mind, please. 
looking up to heaven. The second example is in John 11, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that you may believe, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, Jesus looked up to pray before calling Lazarus from the tomb. These two passages illustrate Jesus' continuing conversation with the Father, and I think Jesus was deliberately drawing our attention to it to show us that it was going on. And there's no magic in the looking up bit. There are, of course, many miracles where Jesus' eye movements are not recorded. And look at John 8, the woman taken in adultery. Jesus actually looks down and draws in the sand. And in that rather fraught, intense atmosphere, I imagine he was praying hard for words of wisdom. But I think the looking up is a good image for us. So Jesus had this continuous conversation with God. It was at the very centre of his life. But, I hear you cry, it was easy for him. He was the son of God. He was part of the Godhead. So of course he had constant communion with the Father. But this is where it gets really special. Let's return to the passage in Acts that was read earlier. Acts chapter 17. Paul says, God is the creator, the giver of life, the master of history. God did this, all of this, so that they, that's us, would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far off from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. We live in God, but God also lives in us. I feel pretty guilty if I don't ring my mother regularly in the evening, but sometimes when I get home I'm just too tired. But with God we don't have to do anything or go anywhere to contact him. He's right there with us. If you invited a dear friend to stay in your house, you wouldn't ignore them completely for 23 hours of the day and then sit down and have an hour-long conversation with them. You'd have conversations with them all the time, even if you were busy. You'd have a chat over the washing up. You'd smile at them as you passed them in the corridor. And you'd think about them while you were planning your day. And think about those of you who can remember that far back. Some of you, it's not so, far, it's not so long ago. When you were young and in love, you might have gone to a dinner party and your loved one was sitting at the far end of the table. And you couldn't talk to them because they were too far away but you might steal surreptitious glances in their direction. And what a thrill it was when you looked up and they were looking at you. Well, God is always looking at us and willing us to look at him. It's very easy to allow ourselves to be submerged by all the stuff we have to deal with and to lose our sense of perspective. When we feel that happening to us, we need to look up from our busyness towards God, just as Jesus did. Brother Lawrence called this practicing the presence of God. Brother Lawrence was a 17th century Carmelite monk, formerly a soldier who worked in the busy monastery kitchen. He developed such a reputation for heavenly mindedness that people would flock to him from miles around to hear his secret. A biographer summarized it as follows. Um, It's the previous one actually. God is everywhere in all places and there is no spot where we cannot draw near to him and to hear him speaking in our heart. With a little love, just a little, we shall not find it hard. So whatever Brother Lawrence found himself doing, he prayed, the time of busyness does not differ with me from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were on my knees. How on earth did he do that? Well, the foundation of this practice is to have an accurate image of God, reflecting the picture of God painted in the Bible. 
I'm going to read a bit from C.S. Lewis's marvellous book, The Screwtape Letters, which you may be familiar with. Uncle Screwtape is a senior devil, and he's writing to his nephew, Wormwood, who's a junior devil. He's learning his craft in tempting. Um, and Wormwood has a, a human who he's in charge of, who uh, they refer to as his patient. This is what uh, Screwtape, Uncle Screwtape, says about prayer. If you examine the object to which he is attending in prayer, you will find that it is a composite object containing many quite ridiculous ingredients. I have known cases where what the patient called his God was actually located up and to the left of the corner of the bedroom ceiling or inside his own head or on a crucifix on the wall. But whatever the nature of the composite object, you must keep him praying to it, to the thing he has made, not to the person who has made him. For if he ever comes to make the distinction, if he ever consciously directs his prayers, not to what I think thou art, but to what thou knowest thyself to be, our situation is, for the moment, desperate. Once all his thoughts and images have been flung aside, and the man trusts himself to the completely real, external, invisible presence there with him in the room, and never knowable by him as he is known by it, why then it is that the incalculable may occur. Once you start to really see God for who he is, then love for him wells up within you so that it overflows into every part of your daily life. Brother Lawrence said, we must not grow weary in doing little things for the love of God, who looks not to the greatness of the deed, but to the love. My most memorable foray into practicing the presence of God uh, happened when I was in my uh, late teens, I, in my gap year. Uh, I found myself on a sheep station in the middle of nowhere in Australia, uh, and it was what they called the dagging season. Now, the dagging season is when they get all the sheep and they cut off the bits from under the tail uh, so that the blowflies don't infest. Now, my job in this was to take the bits of wool that had come from under the sheep's tail uh, and sort them out so that uh, the dungy bits were separated from the nice new bits of wool that you could use. So I found myself in the middle of this enormous shearing shed, incredibly noisy and dusty and dirty, uh, knee-deep in bits of wool and dirt and dung. Um, and it was so noisy that I found I could sing uh, really loudly and nobody could hear. They must have thought I was a bit odd because my lips were moving, but they couldn't hear. So I sang to myself um, a, a famous old song, In my life, Lord, be glorified. By my hands, Lord, be glorified. So here are some things that you might find helpful during your busy days. Pause to pray for a minute before you do a difficult task. Pray while you're doing a task, particularly something routine, washing up or filing or driving along. When you're driving, please don't shut your eyes and raise your hands. <laughs> Have a note on your desk or your screensaver or your fridge to remind you to look up from your stuff towards God. Set a regular alarm on your phone or clock Play worship music or teaching discs or audio Bible in the car as you drive. Go for a walk. Look out of the window. If your office doesn't have a window, consider changing jobs. <laughs> Look at the flowers or trees or clouds, whatever you can see, God made it. Listen out for birdsong or other music. Allow these things to bring your attention back to God. Lift your eyes to the hills. I had an ergonomics assessment uh, at work the other day. Um, she spent some time looking at how I was sitting at my desk, how I was typing, um, how I was uh, using the phone, uh, basically to, to make sure that I wasn't going to get terrible strains and back and things. Um, and she gave me exercises to do every 20 minutes. Um, and she said I should set an alarm on my computer to, to make me do this. And those exercises were for my, for my muscles and for my eyes and so on. We need to do that for our spirits as well. What a good discipline it would be for us as Christians to 
just stop what we're doing every 20 minutes or so and pause to refocus on God just for a minute. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm going to play a song now, uh, my expert at the back. Um, It's called Oceans, um, and I think that the chorus summarises what I've been trying to say. Uh, Think of the waves as uh, the daily grind which threatens to submerge you. And the chorus is, I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise. My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. If you know it or pick it up, do feel free to sing along. The words will be on the screen. Um, Or just sit quietly and listen. And you are 